you all for joining us. My name is Kim Stevenson, and I am the Manager of Clinical Health Data Analysis and Research here at MHA. On behalf of MHA and our Vice President for Clinical Integration, Dr. Steve Defaze, I would like to welcome everyone to today's webinar on maximizing your potential in MIS. We are closing in on the final quarter of the 2017 performance period and know that data submission is right around the quarter. So we are hopeful that today's and next week's presentations on macro will help all of you in your final preparations. Before we get started, I just wanted to quickly go over today's format. We are happy to have Leela Valinsky from the New England Quality Innovation Network Quality Improvement Organization giving today's presentation. Following the presentation, there will be Q&A time available. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted to our MHA website for your review at a later date and for you to share with others in your organization who are unable to make today's webinar. Now I would like to introduce our presenter, Leela Valinsky. Leela has over nine years of experience in healthcare and holds a Master's of Science in Nursing and a Master's of Health Administration. Leela has extensive knowledge of healthcare information technology, clinical workflows, and governmental quality and process improvement programs. Leela has a wide breadth of expertise related to healthcare payment reform and the Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act, or MACRA. Leela has presented at numerous national and regional conferences on MACRA and focuses her efforts on how clinicians and practices can achieve reporting success resulting in positive payment adjustments. Thank you for uh, being with us today, Leela. Thank you for the introduction, Kim. Welcome, everyone, to Maximizing Your Potential in MIT. As Kim mentioned, my name is Lila Valinsky. I am a senior program administrator at the New England Quality Innovation Network Quality Improvement Organization, as well as the New England Regional Lead for the Quality Payment Program work. Before we get started, I just want to provide a quick disclaimer. While all of this material comes directly from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services documentation, we created these slides. A quick overview of today's program, I will discuss uh, MIPS as a program. We will get into eligibility. We'll talk a little about the MIPS reporting cases, key decisions that you should be making as you plan for reporting, the MIPS program performance categories, a recipe for reporting, resources, and time for questions at the very end. As many of you know, CMS loves to use acronyms. Here's a list of some of the common acronyms you will hear today. CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, MACRA, the Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act, MIPS, the Merit-Based Incentive Payment System, QPP, the Quality Payment Program, PQRS, the Physician Quality Reporting System, VBM, the Value-Based Modifier, ACI, Advancing Care Information, and finally, Eligible Clinicians, or ECs. When we talk about the Quality Payment Program, it's important to understand the legislation that created it. NACRA, the Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act, was signed into law in April of 2015. It garnered significant bipartisan support and repealed the Sustainable Growth Rate Formula. It also created the Quality Payment Program, or QPP. Under the Quality Payment Program, there are two tracks for payment incentives for clinicians. The first, is MIPS, which is the Merit-Based Incentive Payment, and will be our focus today. And the second is Alternative Payment Model, or APM. If you're part of an APM or would like to learn more about APM, please plan to participate in our other webinar, which will be occurring at this same time next Monday, September 18th. As we talk about MIPS, the MIPS program consolidates three legacy payment programs, the Physician Quality Reporting System, CQRS, Meaningful Use, or MU, and the Value-Based Modifier. They all come together to create MIPS. Part of the incentive in creating this program was that CMS was looking to reduce reporting requirements for clinicians, making the programs align a little better, and again, reducing those requirements so that clinicians would have fewer programs to report to, fewer requirements, and more opportunities to receive an incentive. The missed financial impact can be great, as you can see on this table. For 2017 performance, clinicians will receive either a positive or negative payment adjustment in 2019. All performance occurs um, in whatever program year, and the payment adjustments are made two years following. So anything done in 2017, the payment adjustment is made in 2019. 
And as you can see by this table, in 2019, you're eligible for either a 4% positive adjustment or a 4% negative adjustment. Those percentage of increase or decrease payments steadily increases from 5 to 7 up to 9% in 2022. We've heard a lot from clinicians over the past few months about eligibility. So I really wanted to touch on this because it is a key piece of determining how you should participate and what sort of other decisions you need to think about. Several months ago, many of you that are organizational administrators, practice managers, and heads of practices may have received a letter similar to the graph on, graphic on the right-hand side. This came directly from CMS. And at the bottom is that table. The table shows for each TIN ID the number of NPIs that are either included or excluded in MIPS reporting. And in that little space, which you can't really see, it would give an explanation of either included or excluded and why. Now, CMS has also provided you with a real-time lookup tool. That lookup tool is available via that link at the top, and that brings you to the page right with the graphic that says MIPS participation status. In that field, you will enter your 10-digit MPI number and click check now, and it will give you a participation status. Either you are included or excluded in reporting in 2017. Now, the calculation that you will be looking at at this present time was done from September 1st of 2015 through August 31st of 2016 and it looks at CMS claims. So based on your claims, did you hit what CMS is calling the low volume threshold, which is either $30,000 in Medicare Part B claims, and you also had to care for upwards of 100 Medicare beneficiaries annually. If you didn't hit either of those targets, you were below either on claims or on the patients you saw, you would be excluded. Now, CMS is doing a second calculation. This second calculation is currently taking place. So from September 1st of 2016 through August 31st of 2017, with that 60-day claims runout period, there will be a secondary calculation. If you are considered to be excluded, you will get another notification that you are excluded. If you are included, you are still expected to report. <clears throat> Within the status, you can also see several special status designations. This is the special status designation that you would see on the page if you are either included or excluded in reporting. They still provide it even if you're excluded. These different designations are critical to how you need to prepare for reporting. So as you can see, there's four different designations for both a clinician as well as a practice. CMS includes both clinician and practice designations because you may be excluded as an individual, but your practice is planning to report as a practice or a group, and so your data will be pulled in. You might think, well, why does that really matter? What matters in that is that if you are considered to be either non-patient facing or hospital based, you do not need to report on the advancing care information category you are excluded due to those special status designations. Now, the interesting piece of that is for a group to be considered that hospital-based means that every single eligible clinician within that practice must be hospital-based. So 100% of the eligible clinicians are hospital-based. If you are part of a practice that includes non-patient-facing clinicians, 75% of your eligible clinicians must be non-patient facing in order to be excluded from reporting in MIPS. That's kind of confusing. There's a bunch of different calculations that go into that. So if you have additional questions on that, please let us know. Now, if you're a small practice, a rural practice, or a practice in a health professional shortage area or HIPSA area, the difference is that you are required to report on fewer improvement activities. So if you're in any of those, designations, you would report on one to two improvement activities to earn full credit in that performance category. Another really key piece of planning to report in this year is figuring out which reporting pace you will select. 
CMS this year offered a pick your pace option. And under the pick your pace option, they're really allowing clinicians and groups to test out the program and see what works best for them. As you can see in the first column of this table, the do nothing category where the guy just stands there, you completely forego reporting. And if you choose to not report anything, you will receive a negative 4% penalty on all of your Medicare Part B claims. We highly recommend you don't go that route. There are many other options that can help you avoid a penalty, and we really hope that you choose to go one of those routes. And we're here to help. The next option is crawl, or as CMS calls it, test. Under this pace, you earn the minimum points for reporting on the minimum amount of data, which is three performance points. If you choose to report on one quality measure, you can choose to report on that measure for less than a 90-day period. And the absolute minimum amount of data that you would have to report is one quality measure on one patient one time. Now, if reporting is extremely difficult for you, that might be a viable option. We highly recommend having roughly 20 or so patients in your denominator just to make sure that should any of those patients be excluded, that you do not fall into the reporting on nothing because you only reported on a single patient who was then excluded. If you choose to report on one improvement activity or the required base advancing care information measures, you are required to report on at least 90 days worth of data. Again, by reporting something, you avoid a negative penalty and would be just neutral. You don't receive a positive payment adjustment. <clears throat> if you choose to report what we call walk, you're earning between four and 69 performance points, and you're reporting on more than 90 days worth of data, anywhere between 90 days and a full calendar year. Now, in this category, you're typically reporting on the maximum amount of data that's required, which would be six quality measures. At least one is an outcome or high priority measure. Again, due to the size of your practice and the points, you would be reporting on one to four improvement activities, and then at least the required advancing care information-based measures. Some people might think, okay, well, that's probably gonna get me a lot of points. That would get you a lot, but it really is all dependent on your performance. So that's where the four to 69 points comes in because every measure you report on gets a different performance score and gets you points towards your end NIP score. By earning four to 69 points, you receive a small positive payment adjustment. If you choose to report on the maximum amount of data, again, between 90 days and a full calendar year, and you excel in reporting, so you're receiving the maximum amount of points on most of the measures and just doing a fantastic job, <clears throat> excuse me, you would be in what we call run. And in this reporting pace, you would earn a moderate positive payment adjustment, which is upwards of 4%, anywhere between one and 4%. And you would also fall into what CMS is calling the exceptional performer bucket. And in that bucket, there is $500 million that have been set aside for those exceptional performers. So if you're looking to receive the highest posit possible positive payment adjustment, run is the pace that you would want to select. As I mentioned, the reporting timeline is shrinking quickly. October 2nd is the very last day to start a 90-day reporting period for 2017. And again, data submission begins January 1st and goes through March 31st. Now, just because October 2nd is the last day to start a 90-day reporting period does not mean that you can't select a 90-day reporting period any other time throughout the calendar year if you can pull the data to support what you've been doing previously. <coughs> as I mentioned, the MIPS performance categories are broken up as such. Quality accounts for 60% of your total MIPS score the maximum possible points is earned through reporting on six measures, at least one outcome or high priority measure. Advancing care information earns you 25% of your MIPS score, and you must report on at least the base measures. If you are able to report on additional measures, you can earn performance and bonus points. 
Improvement activities account for 15% of your MIPS score, and you must report on one to four activities. Again, rural and small practices only need to report on one to two. Cost is the fourth category we don't talk much about because it's 0% of your score in this transitional year. However, it's important to think about your cost and utilization going forward. In the 2018 program year two proposed rule, cost remains at 0%. However, that might change. So it's really imperative that clinicians and practices start thinking about how they are performing, how they are using resources, and where their overall cost is compared to their fellow clinicians either in similar practices or similar regions of the country. So, how should you be preparing? What sort of decisions do you need to be making as we come into this last quarter of the year? The first decision, this is again, assuming that you're eligible and you need to report. So the first decision would be, will you be reporting either as an individual or as a group? We get this question a lot, and unfortunately, it's not one that we have a magic wand that can say this will make the most sense for you or not. Really, individual reporting makes sense for those clinicians in very small practices because their data supports their specific activities. If you're in a group and you need fellow clinicians' performance to maybe help improve performance overall, or you're in a group of several clinicians and you're having trouble meeting the requirements for some of those advancing care information category requirements, having a group aggregate score might help get you over that hump and help ensure that you're successful and earn that base 50%. The next decision to make, as I mentioned, is choosing your reporting pace. So will you go the crawl, so the minimum amount of data? Will you choose walk? where you're reporting on at least 90 days worth of data and have mid performance somewhere between four and 69 points? Or will you choose run, where you're performing exceptionally well and you're reporting data for up to 90 days and over? Next, and this is very critical when it comes to quality, what data submission method are you using? And those of you who have attended previous presentations of mine, know that I love talking about quality measure, decile score performance. So in this, it's critical to understand if you're going to report claims as an individual, attestation isn't available for quality, that's for the other two categories. So claims, EHR direct, registry, QCDR, or qualified clinical data registry, or if you're in a large group using the CMS web interface. <laughs> We'll talk a little more about quality measure scoring in just a few moments. The next key decision is, have you previously reported through PQRS or MU? And what was your data like? Were you an exceptional performer in those programs or did you struggle to reach the requirements? If you struggled, I would highly recommend that you outreach to either my organization or to Kim at MHA, we are here to help and make sure that you guys are successful. So please don't struggle through this. If you're unsure, reach out. Finally, do you have supporting documentation available to demonstrate either your reporting numerators and denominators, as well as supporting those improvement activities that you might have implemented? We'll talk more about improvement activities, but supporting documentation is key and essential. Keep in mind data completeness. So this is for quality measure reporting primarily. If you report claims, you are required to report on at least 50% of your Medicare claims patients. 50% of all Medicare claims patients must be reported on. If you report using an EHR, a registry, or a QCDR, you need to report on at least 50% of all of your patients, regardless of payer. Again, as I mentioned, Supporting documentation is critical. It tells the story of how you've implemented whatever process, workflow, activity, patient engagement, encounter, whatever the case might be. Extremely important to make sure that you have tools and resources available to support what you've done. CMS 
may come back and audit anywhere up to six years after you attack. <coughs> Quality. Oh, sorry, I'm in a quick drink. The quality performance category accounts for 60% of the final MIPS score. There are over 270 available quality measures. The maximum score, as I mentioned, is earned by reporting on six measures. And again, you have to have at least one outcome or high priority measure. If you're a specialist, there are 30 specialty measure sets to choose from. And again, this isn't a comprehensive list of specialties. Um, if you are a podiatrist, there actually isn't a specialty measure set for you, so not everything has been accounted for. <coughs> you can report data for as little as a single instance, as I mentioned, all the way up to a full calendar year. A 90-day reporting period must start no later than October 2nd, and the available reporting methodologies are, again, claims, but only if you're reporting as an individual, EHR Direct, if your EHR can support it, Registry or QCDR. The CMS web interface is only available for clinicians in groups of greater than 25 that have already registered with CMS. And if you're in a group of over 16 eligible clinicians, you will be required to report on an all-cause readmission measure that's pulled from claims directly. You don't actually need to, support, to <clears throat> supply anything to CMS. They will just pull that for you. So in quality measure selection, again, these should look very similar to what we already talked about. Did you previously report to PQRS or Meaningful Use? Both of those programs had a quality measure component. So depending on how you previously performed, you may find it very easy to select measures and perform well, or more challenging if you haven't previously performed any of those measures. How do you identify those measures? So again, if you reported to either of these programs, you might already know your measures if they carried forward. Will you be selecting one of those specialty measure sets that I mentioned? Or will you select just a handful of measures on your own? What's your target performance overall? So we won't get into a lot of the scoring, but based on the reporting method you select, so let's say it's claims, the measures you choose have various performance decile. So if you report on the A1C poor control measure, so that's for patients that have an A1C of greater than nine during the reporting period, how is your performance? I don't have the deciles memorized, but let's say if you report claims and you perform at a 14%, you would earn seven decile points, seven decile performance points. Now, multiply that 7 times 6 if you're targeting a 7, and you would get a 42%. So across the board, you need to know how your performance lines up to where you want to perform overall in the category. Are you looking to achieve as many of the 60 possible quality performance points, or are you okay with just earning 50% of those, so 30%? It's really up to you where you're targeting. But again, if you can earn 70 plus NIPS performance points across the program, you are eligible for some of that $500,000 exceptional performer bonus. The next element to consider is do you have a clinician or practice workflow in place that makes sure that clinicians know where to document and they know where to pull the documentation from? Next, can you actually pull the reports to demonstrate your performance on the various measures, and what's your data look like? Does it tell the story? For advancing care information, this accounts for 25% of your total MIPS score. Across this category, you can earn a total of 155 performance points. You're capped at 100%. But the way it breaks down is 50% of that 155 comes from the base required measures. If you're unable to report for any of those based required measures, unfortunately, you would earn a zero for this performance category, and you are unable to earn any bonus or, perform or performance score points. <clears throat> if you can achieve the 50% base, you can also then move on and receive anywhere of up to 90% on the performance measures. And then if you do well on those and you want to report on additional measures, you can report on the 15 um, possible bonus points. 
again, you're capped at 100, so the max performance score you could get would be 25% of your MIPS score. You must report for at least 90 days. You must start a 90-day reporting period no later than October 2nd. And under this performance category, you do have the option of a testing, and a testing means that you would go in and manually key in your numerator, denominator, or exclusion based on whatever the measure requirements are. Again, you can use EHR Direct if your EHR can support that, registry or QCDR, or the CMS web interface. Some considerations for the advancing care information category are, again, have you previously reported to meaningful use? All of these measures are carryovers from meaningful use. So if you reported on that program and you felt comfortable and knew how to use your EHR to a sufficient extent and just felt good about your data, this should look pretty similar. <clears throat> again, do you have workflows in place to capture the necessary data in a discrete manner? What's your target performance? Are you just trying to achieve the base score, or do you want to go for some of the performance and bonus points? Can you pull data reports? Again, this is key. Can your EHR generate reports that demonstrate how you're performing? And does your practice have any of those excluded clinicians that I mentioned? So that's the hospital base or the non-patient facing clinician. If you do, you can always include them in reporting if they will help your performance. However, if they won't and you are not required to report on them, you do not need to report on them. However, we've heard from several organizations that it's actually more intensive to pull those clinicians out of their group reports than it would be just to include them. So keep that in mind as well. What's the administrative burden to take them out of those reports? Improvement activities <clears throat> accounts for 15% of the MIPS final score. This is a new category, so it probably looks a little unfamiliar to some of you. I like to call improvement activities um, quality measures on steroids. They're, they're kind of looking more at workflows, patient engagement, expanding practice access, care coordination, population health, just really looking at the whole care continuum. For practices of fewer than 15 clinicians, you would be reporting on one to two activities to receive full credit. If you're in a practice of greater than 16 eligible clinicians, you will be reporting on two to four activities to earn full credit. Activities are weighted as medium or high. Medium weight activities earn 10 points. High weighted activities earn 20. If your practice is patient-centered medical home certified, you would earn full credit. You don't need to do any additional improvement activity reporting. So some of the key decisions to make when you're selecting improvement activities are, how do you engage patients in their care? Do you have a portal? Do you include them in the care planning process and include family members? Does your practice have a specific quality improvement program in place? Do you have leadership meetings once a month or once every other month where you talk about quality improvement activities and different initiatives and how to track those? Do you look at data reports and patient satisfaction surveys? What do you do to coordinate care for patients with chronic conditions? So, of course, these would be the patients with diabetes, heart failure, COPD, um, anyone else in disparate populations or who have other high-risk comorbidities. How do you handle care coordination for all of your patients across the board? What do you look at? Do you have embedded care coordinators or centralized care coordinators or other programs that address post-discharge high-risk patients? Do you utilize your EHR to document patient reported outcomes or care plans? This one's really important because it touches on a couple different aspects and actually can earn you quite a few bonus points. So under the improvement activities, if you utilize your EHR in some way, there's 18 improvement activities that utilize an EHR, you can earn 10 of those advancing care information bonus percentage points. So you earn a bunch of points right there as a bonus for you to, using the EHR, and you get one of or more of your improvement activities taken care of. So look at how you can integrate your EHR if you're not already integrating it. Uh, we're happy to help you with that. 
we do a lot of work and often recommend the patient portal. So making your patient portal as robust as possible, engaging patients in portal utilization if they're not already on it, and just making it a really smooth and seamless process for communication back and forth between clinicians and patients or family members. The last major topic to cover under improvement activities is does your practice make self-management educational materials and programs available to patients? As we look at how to improve patient care and improve the wellness of our patients, it's really important to, to make sure that patients take accountability for their care and seek out ways to self-manage. Through the Quinn QIO, we offer a really tremendous diabetes self-management education program. It's six weeks, the patients get really engaged and it's wonderful to see them actually take accountability for their care and their wellness. So think about those kind of programs if you haven't already. As I mentioned, cost is 0% for this NIPS uh, transition year. However, it's really important to start looking at how you're performing now. CMS is generating feedback reports. Those will be your QRUR reports. They are a bit cumbersome to get, so if you're having trouble, please let us know. We're happy to help you get a hold of those reports and see how you're performing. <clears throat> As I mentioned, have you previously reported or accessed your QRUR reports? And how does your practice do in utilizing utilization of materials and cost containment? Just as a reminder, the quality payment program proposed rule for calendar year two, which is 2018, Cost remained at 0%. However, it's expected to jump to 30% by 2019. Legally, it has to jump to 30%. So there is some expectation that there might be a phased in approach this year, but it's hard to know what the final rule will be until it's released sometime mid to late October. In the proposed year, the proposed rule, it was also mentioned that it may include some different measures. So CMS is looking at a 12-month reporting period, and they would only be looking at that Medicare spending per beneficiary and total per capita cost measures. There's currently 10 episode-based measures that are pulled directly from the supplemental QRUR report. However, CMS is looking at developing a completely new set of more appropriate measures. Uh, so more to come on that. I unfortunately don't have much detail because the final rule has not been released yet, but stay tuned because you might need to be reporting on cost. So again, the MIPS final score is calculated using the quality performance category score times 60, because it's 60% of the score. The advancing care information category score times 25, because it's 25% of the score. And the improvement activities category score times 15, because it's 15% of the score. Again, cost does not equate to any portion of the score this year. Multiply that by 100 and you will get your final score. That final score is the key piece in determining your performance. So again, if you choose to not participate at all, you will be in the performance score zero bucket and you will receive a 4% negative payment adjustment. If you report on the minimum amount of data, you would be in the performance score of three and you would be neutral, so no positive, no negative payment adjustment. If you report on a moderate amount of data and your performance is in the mid-range, you will earn four to 69 performance points and you will earn a small positive payment adjustment, somewhere around 1% likely of your Medicare Part B claims. And finally, if you're in the 70 plus performance score, you are considered an exceptional performer and you would earn a mod modest positive payment, somewhere between 1% and 4%, and the opportunity to earn part of that exceptional performer bonus that I mentioned, which is that $500 million. Something that we don't talk about a lot but really needs to come into the equation is public reporting. So there is a website called Physician Compare. This screenshot at the bottom of the screen is what Physician Compare currently looks like. Based on this data, you really don't get a very good idea of how well this clinician is performing in the various quality 
reporting programs. As you can see, Medicare assignment, this clinician accepts Medicare patients, participates in quality activities, they use a, an electronic health record, and they require reported performance information. That's all you get. It doesn't tell you a whole lot. They could be a super high performer, or they could be a mediocre performer, or they could be a poor performer. With a phased implementation of Physician Compare, there is talk that over the next few years of the MIPS program, CMS will start providing specific information related to either the composite score, the performance category measures, aggregate information, so this would be the range of composite and performance category scores if you're in a group, and utilization data on the Physician Compare website. So if you're in a group, you might think, okay, well, I'll just get my group score and that'll be all set. But remember, your group score is an aggregate score. So however everyone does is how everyone does. So if you're doing just sort of a mediocre job, you might want to consider looking at either reporting individually, if you can perform better, or trying to achieve a higher performance rate as a group if that's a goal. Now, how this data will be used is really up to the time to tell. Um, I don't know, as a consumer, would I go to this website and look for information on my clinician? Maybe, maybe not. I know it doesn't hold a lot of information right now. Down the road, it might become a more valuable tool and actually determine whether or not clinicians are sought out for treatment. There has been talk as well that we've heard that this may be um, part of compensation discussions within organizations as well as part of hiring discussions. So really critical to start thinking about your performance overall and where you want your performance to potentially show if it is made public. You will have the opportunity to review all of the data prior to it being made public on Physician Compare. And side note, nothing from the 2017 transition year will be made available on Physician Compare. So you have a year before the data is made public. <clears throat> Just briefly, as I mentioned, we have a recipe for reporting. So these are the steps, as I mentioned already, but a little different way to present it, to plan out how you're reporting in this 2017 transition year. So the first step is to determine your eligibility. So you need to look at your claims and your Medicare patient volume. If you are under $30,000 in Medicare Part B claims and care for fewer than 100 Medicare patients annually, you would be excluded. If you are above both of those, as it shows on the screen, you would be included. You can always check that eligibility determination tool on the CMS QPP website, and it will tell you right there if you're eligible or excluded. You need to select the pace. So are you going to report crawl, so that minimum amount of data, walk, the medium amount of data for medium performance, or run as much data as possible and performing at a very high level. You need to determine how you will report, individual or as a group, <clears throat> and determine the data submission method. After you've done that, it's of course selecting the measures and activities you'll report on. This year, 2017, you can pretty much select any quality measure you want to report on, although some probably don't really relate to your specialty. If, if you're a, an internal med clinician, you probably don't want to be reporting on radiology measures, but it's up to you. You also need to identify the measures that are available under your reporting methodology. Again, selecting activities that fit your patient practice <coughs> and your quality improvement goals. Review your data. How does your performance look on the selected measures? Do you have at least one patient in the numerator of all of your selected quality measures and those required advancing care information base measures. If you're planning on reporting using attestation, be sure to get an EIDM account. That is the website. You will also need one of those accounts if you would like to receive your QR UR report. You'll need to plan on submitting data to CMS no later than March 31st. This is an important date to remember. If you can, I would try not to wait until the last minute so if you can submit data somewhere between 
mid-January and mid-February, you're probably setting yourself up a little better than if you waited until, let's say, March 28th, and for some reason the selected reporting method were down, um, that would be a scramble. So try to report earlier if possible. And again, payment adjustments are made for this performance year in 2019. You will receive some performance information from CMS sometime next year in 2018. Honestly, I don't know when. Um, it's, it's hard to tell when CMS will make performance evaluation reports available, but again, payments won't be made until 2019. And then, of course, start planning for the next year. So we're almost to the end of 2017, which is a big, tremendous push for many people, but once 2017 ends, it's right on to 2018. So just be prepared and have all of the resources you need ready to go. <clears throat> Here are some resources. This is our website, uh, neqpp.org. We have a great ask a question, so if you don't have questions now or you think of something after the fact, feel free to send us an email with the question. That next bullet is the CMS Quality Payment Program website. There is a wealth of information there. The next is the Massachusetts Health and Hospital Association's website. They also have a wealth of information. And if you're interested in the CMS Year 2 proposed rule, there is a link to that. Again, I am expecting the final rule, hopefully mid-October, but it could be as late as the end of October, sometime in October. <clears throat> we will open it up for questions now. Those are my lovely dogs. Uh, it's one of my pug's birthdays today, so I like to celebrate with a little picture of them. If you would like to ask a question in chat, feel free to type that in. If you would like to ask a question over the phone, you may click uh, pound six to unmute yourself. And Leela, this is Morgan. While people um, get their selves un themselves unmuted or ask the questions in chat, I did want to let everyone know that um, before you close out of the webinar today, in the bottom right corner of your screen, there's a link to the session evaluation. If you'll just click on that and then hit browse to, the evaluation will automatically pop up on your screen. So um, if you guys are hopping off a little early, please make sure to do that first. And it looks like there may be some questions coming in chat soon, Leela. Great, thanks, Morgan. So Jeff just asked the question, in calendar year 2017, does reporting only the advancing care information measures allow you to avoid a penalty in 2019? Yes, Jeff, absolutely. If you can report on the required base measures or even some of the performance measures, you would avoid a penalty. Again, for advancing care information, you have to report for at least 90 days. So just keep that piece in mind. But reporting on ACI would absolutely avoid a penalty. While people are thinking of questions, just a curious poll, and feel free to send it to me individually if you don't want to report it to the group in chat, but how is everyone feeling in terms of their preparation? Do you feel comfortable? Are you unsure? Um, are you really unsure and just feel swamped? Um, how do you feel you're, you're doing as we're coming into that last 90-day period? EIDM accounts are not a new, they were used in PQRS previously, not meaningfully used. Uh, Bill asked, can you use attestation for all categories? No, unfortunately, you can only use attestation for advancing care information and improvement activities. I'm not entirely sure why CMS isn't allowing attestation for quality, but for quality, you have to report either through claims, your EHR directly, a registry or qualified clinical data registry, or again, if you're part of a large group through the CMS web interface, but attestation is not an option for quality. Um, so Bill, once you have an EIDM account, it depends on what role you have within the practice. If you are the clinician, I can't remember them off the top of my head, but I think one is clinician. 
if you are not a clinician, but you are, let's say, a practice administrator or practice manager, security official is the determine the um, account type you would want to have because that will allow you to um, submit data as well as access previous data for your practice. So clinician, I believe it says clinician, anyone else who's just looking at the data or testing would want to be a security official. Hi, Leela. This is Steve Defesta at MHA. I just want to say what a wonderful presentation this was. Um, you're obviously really expert in this, and I hope it was very helpful to the members as much as it was to us here at MHA. Thank you, Steve. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Let's see, I had another question. Our TIN includes all physician practices, which is under an FQHC. Great question. We hear about that periodically but our hospitalists are paid under this TIN as a specialty group. Can they use this TIN to report even though the TIN includes all another practice of primary care providers who do not have to report? Um, so if your hospitalists are eligible for reporting, they must report. If you report as a group, I don't know how many hospitalists you have under your practice, but let's say it's 10 plus, if you chose to report as a group, you would have to report every eligible clinician. So even those clinicians under your FQHC that might otherwise be excluded would have to be pulled in. They wouldn't receive um, a penalty. They would only receive a, a positive, but they would have to include their data. If they chose to report as individuals, the hospitalists could just choose to report as individuals on their own. So. If you report as a group, you have to include everyone within the TIN that is eligible. If you report as individuals, it's only those individual clinicians that are eligible. Did that, I hope that answered your question. Hi, Lila. This is Kim Stevenson. I'm just going to jump in um, while questions are still coming in. Um, I just want to remind people before everyone um, gets off the line that we are also having another webinar next week, the same time next Monday, the 18th, and that will be on alternative payment models. And thanks again, Leela, for doing such a great presentation this week. Absolutely, happy to help. And like I said, feel free, if you're uncomfortable asking questions in a public forum, feel free to shoot, um, I'll put my email right in chat, actually it's on the next slide, so I can just give you that. Feel free to send me an email directly, I'm happy to help. Um, we, as I mentioned, are CMS contractors. All of our support services are at no cost to the clinicians. So if you have lots of questions, really have no idea where to start, please don't hesitate to reach out. Our goal is to make sure that none of the clinicians in Massachusetts receive a penalty because we are here to help you. <laughs> 